What do most Fortune 500 executives have in common? After more than 150 conversations with executives from companies like Disney, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, I've learned that sports is a common denominator. Some of our guests' athletic experiences earned them a place in their sports hall of fame, like Chick-fil-A chairman Dan Cathy. Some hung up their cleats after high school, like Delta Airlines CEO Ed Bastian, while others, like Condoleezza Rice, claim they weren't that great in their sport. But no matter their skill level, they have all told me that being a part of a team taught them leadership lessons that they still use today. In partnership with Chief Executive Magazine, I'm your host, Don Yeager, here to give you an all-access pass to genuine, authentic, fireside chat-like conversations with today's business icons so that you can create powerful change in your organization. This is Corporate Competitor Podcast. With me for today's episode is Charles Watson, the CEO of Tropical Smoothie Cafe. And let me tell you, this guy is no stranger to making big plays. Charles played college football at Cornell. Since stepping into the CEO role at Tropical Smoothie Cafe in 2018, Charles has led the brand to incredible heights, growing from 265 locations to more than 1,400 across 44 states. Charles brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to the table as a board member of the International Franchise Association and Certified Franchise Executive Program. Make sure to check out corporatecompetitorpodcast.com slash notes for my notes from today's session. You'll find my favorite quotes and reflection questions that will help you integrate today's insights. You're going to be put on stage at some point. Before I walk out on stage at our conference, that thought runs through my mind. You've been here before. And to others, I'll say, it's going to be your turn at some point. And guess what? You don't know when it's going to come. And most likely when it comes, you're not really going to be prepared and it's going to be hard, but walk through it. Give it your best. Give it your all. Whether you shank the punt or whether you hit it 70 yards, you've had that experience. And by having that experience, you are then made better. Charles, thanks for joining us. Oh, Don, I'm excited to be here, my friend. Thank you. I'm equally excited to dive into your early years playing football. But first, I wanted to ask you about the adjustments you had to make in your leadership style when you became CEO. I read a Medium article that you were quoted in about your leadership, and I was really taken by your answers on the topic. I learned if I respond to emails or make decisions too quickly, it eliminates a lot of great ideas and work that my team could add to the conversation. So now I try to be the last to respond, not the first. And you view your job as the one who should clear the roadblocks. I had never quite thought about it in exactly that way until you said it that way. Sure. So I spent 20 plus years in franchise development, which is sales to some degree. Right. The cardinal rule imprinted in my brain is time kills all deals. Speed, speed, speed. Doesn't mean inaccuracy, but you need accurate speed. As I become CEO and all the people that are my colleagues now report to me. And that's a strange place to be. You know what? I'm going to take a different stance here. I'm going to say, we're still colleagues. Nothing's changed. It really hasn't. But all of a sudden, this additional level of respect, and Charles must know what he's talking about, came with three little letters, C-E-O. That's just not the case. Same guy. So what I found was when I would jump into an email chain or if we're in a meeting and I spoke up, the conversation ended. Mm. My initial reaction was to go fast and actually I needed to go slow because it stifled creativity. And how do you learn great ideas? You make mistakes. So I still struggle with that today. Sometimes I'll have to backtrack and say, hey, hey, just kidding. Actually, I think the opposite. Play devil's advocate sometimes just to get more thinking out of it. Right. I've had to be very conscious of it. I think I did have a slow down sticky note in front of my computer. I have a pin board It's right behind where my computer is and where I sit. So it reminds me of the things that are most important. Being very conscious about it. And it's so hard to watch things stack up for me. 
I'm a little bit OCD in that way. I want to get to the answer and get to the end very quickly. And if you do, you don't get to the best answer. I've made that mistake enough times. And it's kind of off-putting to people because you may come back with what amounts to a no. I think the sky is blue. No, it's magenta. Okay, well, then I'm wrong. And that's not what I mean at all, but that's how it comes across. So just emotional intelligence and awareness are two things that every CEO has to have a whole lot of. Yeah, and it doesn't naturally come. I mean, you have to learn how to navigate those things yourself. There was a couple of other things that you said in that interview that really stood out to me. You talked about the relationship between a company and its employees must be mutually beneficial. Talk to me about how that came to life for you and what you've learned as a leader in the last few years around creating that mutually beneficial relationship. I'm a selfish, career-driven little guy. I was in development. I was in sales. So I, I like money as well. I'm a little bit financially driven. Coin operated. That's right. It's not bad. There's nothing the matter with those things. So I've taken all my experience of what's between my ears and said, you know what? I bet you there's a lot of people in my organization that are thinking the exact same way I did. I am 24. I'm at Tropical Smoothie and I am the assistant director of marketing. What am I trying to get out of this position to go on to the director title, to the VP title, to jump to another company, to jump to another industry? What tools are we at Tropical Smoothie Cafe putting in the box of our employees? The toolbox. Yes, we give them a paycheck. Paycheck goes in there every two weeks. Yes, we have a bonus every year. That goes in there, right? Allows you to pay your bills, allows you to live your life. But the important things that drive real value and real future value for earnings and for positions is the skill set. In this day and age, it's not just about the paycheck. If it was only about the paycheck, this would be easy. It's not. It's about what can this company, this organization, pour in to its employees. It's a two-way street. We have to give opportunity to get better and to learn and to be around other people that have more experience and have more learnings and to work on great projects and to try new things and to make mistakes and dust themselves off and get back up. But they're not going to be happy somewhere because at the end of the day, you may not have employees here for the next 30 years. In fact, we know that to be the case. Right. To get the most out of them while they're here, they have to be getting something other than a paycheck. And we got to be filling up their toolbox at all times. One of the things that stands out there is that each employee doesn't necessarily need the same things in their toolbox. So one of the challenges for you as leadership team is getting to know what belongs in employee A's toolbox versus employee B's. How do you go about that? You actually try to get to know your employees. It's really complicated, Don. It's a secret. I stand up from my chair and I walk around the office and I say hello to people and I talk to them. It's amazing. No way. You do that? <laughs> I do. Wow. Crazy, isn't it? Listen, some days I can barely get out of my desk meeting after meeting after meeting, but we take the opportunity at Tropical Smoothie to bring together. We do quarterly business meetings. We do offsites, et cetera, just like lots of other companies do. But it's taking those moments and understanding that they're precious to go have a conversation. Could be three minutes, could be five minutes, could be seven minutes. Those conversations matter. Now, as an organization grows, you're going to get some of that feedback through whatever your HR processes are. But I really am so interested in those discussions to understand each individual employee and what they're going on. And when I have that information in my brain, and then I go out and I talk to people, it's not a direct, hey, I heard this, but hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? And it's like, you're psychic. You know a little bit about what they're good at and what they're struggling with, and you can help a little bit there. My job is just to encourage. I'm not going to go fix anything. The direct leaders are going to have to do that. But if I can provide a word or two of encouragement, Don, it's just like a coach, giving you a kick in the butt or a pat on the back. It matters. It matters and it drives you in the right direction that you need to go. Yeah, John Wood used to say, I love to pat every player on the back. Some of them a little lower than the others, but you know. Uh, exactly, yeah. So your family instilled a strong work ethic in you with the mantra, chopping wood. Right. You work until the job is done. How has this mindset, working in your father's restaurant, influenced your approach to leadership and entrepreneurship? You know, my dad and I used to say, Dad, when are we going to do something? He's like, we are going to do something. Come on over to the restaurant and hang out with me. You can wash dishes. I'll cook. And yeah, we'll be, quote unquote, hanging out. You know, at that time, 
it felt like, no, I wanted to go for an ice cream or I wanted to go throw the ball or whatever it was. But my dad was a grinder. He was in early in the morning and left late at night. It was like he was chained to the restaurant. So I learned a ton of work ethic from there. But you know what, Don? My mother, who, by the way, had to start a business, run it, and ultimately support me through a private education and an Ivy League school, she had to be efficient and effective with her time. She only had so many hours of work. And then she had to get home and do whatever she had to do for me, whether that was cook dinner or take me to dinner or get me to practice or whatever it may be. So as I've gotten older, I've really learned to respect my mother's efficiency as much as kind of what I learned from my father that show up and just grind and just chop wood. The gift that your father had to give you of understanding entrepreneurship, and that's who you're trying to support today. Yeah. The very entrepreneurs, the grinders, the people who are willing to go out and work through the tough times. That entrepreneur bug, how do you know whether they really have it? It's the work ethic that they put in to understanding the business. Mm. It's are they calling other franchisees? Are they doing their diligence? If it's just, hey, I want to do this and let's go and I'm ready to sign the documents, that's actually a bad sign. The average poor salesperson would say, yeah, yeah, sign up. Let's go. Great. We know that it's the people that put in the time and the effort and the diligence that end up being the best franchisees that think about it just a little bit harder. You know why they're thinking about it harder? Because they actually know how hard it's going to be. And they actually know that they have to make a really great decision. So that's what I would say is key is just the effort put into the diligence process. And we always look for passion, Don. Why? Yes, it's a business. You can make money. You can make money doing a million things. Why do you want to make money this way? What's interesting about this way of doing it? Right. I had the really great fortune of interviewing one of your franchisees a couple of weeks ago, Clement Troutman in the Maryland, D.C. area. Yep. Here's this guy who was leaving a six-figure job as a consultant to become a tropical smoothie owner. Do you ever worry when you see things like that, where someone's walking away from guaranteed revenue? Do you ever try to talk anyone out of it? I do. And Clement is a very unique person. You know what Clement's email address is? Serve the masses at gmail.com. Serve the masses. That's somebody that wants to serve their community more than just sell a smoothie or wrap or a flatbread. But I do worry, Don, sometimes, you know, hey, I'm making $150,000, $200,000 in corporate America. What people in corporate America don't understand about at least our business is that you've been the head controller for whatever company. You're now going into a business where you're the head cook and the bottle washer, as we used to say in restaurants. You're the accountant. You're the finance person. You're the marketing person. You're the operations person. You're the recruiter. You're the recruiter. You're everything all at once, all at the same time. And it takes a special person to be able to juggle all those balls. It doesn't mean you're a good or a bad person if you like doing that. It's being a specialist versus being a generalist. I do have those conversations often with people. And listen, I've had just as many people go from being specialists to generalists and do great at tropical smoothie. And I've had a few that didn't work out because it was too much, but a great development organization will explain that exact phenomenon to you for you to think about before you jump into the business. Let's go specialist versus generalist. (laughs) You played quarterback in high school. I did. But you go to college to join the football team at Cornell. And then suddenly they say, we have this different role for you. Yep. 18 year old quarterback and was all about it. That was my favorite sport. I remember telling the coach in high school, I'd like to play quarterback or I'd like to not play. You said this to the high school coach. Yeah. I drew a line in the sand. Yeah, That's my ego gone awry. I don't have to start, but that's a position I want to play. So I knew what I wanted. And when I left high school and went to Cornell, I thought, well, I was a pretty good punter. I didn't know I was a good punter. It was just fourth down and I'd go back and kick the ball and it went a long way. Yay. Good stuff. So my senior year, there were some other schools that were like, wow, you really can kick the ball very far. I'm interested in that. I had no clue. I was a clueless 18-year-old, but I was an egomaniac 18-year-old as well. So when I went to Cornell, I walked over to the quarterback huddle with the, you know, six or eight quarterbacks that were there. And I was just as tall as everybody. I thought I had just as good an arm as everybody. And the coach grabbed me by the shoulder pad and said, hey, Charles, we don't have a punter. Congratulations. You're the starting punter. You could have hit me over the head with a sledgehammer. That was not good. That was not what I wanted to hear, right? I was willing to compete for something that I wanted to do. So that was a really big transition for me. And I spent the first two years being the starting punter and being really upset about it. 
not wanting to play, not wanting to be at the school, not wanting to do that because my ego had been hurt. I was relegated to a specialist position that didn't get the glory of other positions. Right. Truth is, how many people can name the punter at their school? Not many. No, not many. And you go from the quarterback. Everything that is going to happen in the game really comes down to your abilities and your play, your mind. Now you're suddenly a guy that's in there four to six times a game for a single play. Yeah. And if you do it really well, no one notices. It's only if you do it poorly that they remember who you are. It's a great position, isn't it? (laughs) Only thing worse is being a kicker, obviously. (laughs) So now you get thrown into this role. You're not happy with it, but you thrived three of the six longest punts in the history of the program are yours. Your yards per punt average still ranks the top 10 all time in the history of the school. So you weren't excited about it, but you managed to thrive as a specialist. Yeah. And my freshman, sophomore year, I remember calling my mother and saying, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be here. Football hasn't worked out, blah, blah, blah. She told me later, I was one phone call away from her saying, fine, come on home, go to the University of Georgia. It's fine. I never made that one more call. You know, (laughs) the great spirit in the sky takes care of you. And there was a game, I think maybe I was a sophomore or junior, and there was maybe a minute left in the game. We were punting out of our own end zone. We were playing Princeton. We were at home and I hit a 70 something yard punt well over the guy's head. Thing went rolling almost to the end zone. And For all intents and purposes, I had some people say, you won the game for us. We were winning by two or three or something like that. They had gotten the ball at the 50-yard line. Good chance with a minute they would have scored. Finally, somebody said, great job. You won the game. That's what I needed, the highest level of achievement. Ego. My ego was involved. I came in with about 55 people in my class. When I ran out on the field for my last football game with all the seniors, Mm. I was one of 12. It graduated as a senior, stick to something, persistence. I bested 40 other people that came to college to play football and didn't make it. They quit. Nothing against any of those people. There are many reasons why they didn't finish playing the sport, but I had a rough road. So I thought I changed my attitude. I got into being a specialist and I graduated as a four-year starter and one of 12 that made it all the way through. It's not about playing the sport. It's about playing the sport for four years because it's hard. Right. It's hard to do. And I'm not anywhere near the level of D1 big time programs. But guess what? I always say in the NCAA, it doesn't matter what division you are. They set the number of hours you can practice. And there's no coach at any level that's not going to use every single one of those hours to practice. Absolutely true. You're going to be put on stage at some point. You're going to be put in the spotlight. Before I walk out on stage at our conference or at various industry things, That thought runs through my mind. You've been here before. You've done this. And to others, I'll say, it's going to be your turn at some point. It's always going to be your turn at some point. And guess what? You don't know when it's going to come. And most likely, when it comes, you're not really going to be prepared, and you're probably going to be nervous, and it's going to be hard. But walk through it. Give it your best. Give it your all. Whether you shank the punt or whether you hit it 70 yards, you've had that experience. And by having that experience, you are then made better. Was there a moment in which failure also taught you something? Yeah, Don, I don't need critics because I'm my toughest critic. Mm. You talk about you get on the field and you punt the ball four times. I spent the next week going, well, the first one was this and that, and it couldn't have been this and blah, blah. I never walked off the field, rarely, rarely walked off the field and went, oh, that was a good punt. Rarely. It didn't go far enough left. It didn't go far enough right. It didn't have enough hang time. It didn't go far enough. They got too good of a return on it. Never satisfied. And that's good and bad. Sometimes you got to give yourself a pat on the back, be positive. I certainly wasn't at 18 to 21. Everything was, I'm not good enough. And it drove me, but it doesn't make you very happy. Balance. Mm -hmm. Trying to find some balance between those two things. Because there's times for being hard on yourself and getting better. And there's times to give yourself a break. Was there a coach somewhere along this journey who's messages to you still kind of ring in the back of your head? I tell you what, it's actually my high school basketball coach. A lot of what we have at Tropical Smithy outside of my door in big, bold letters, trust. I believe in trust. Transparent, responsible, unique, service-oriented, and tenacious. Mm -hmm. 
But you know where that comes from? It comes from my high school basketball coach. Did he ever have us memorize anything? No. But he had sayings in our locker room, RTL, refuse to lose, roar, rebound, outlet, and run. How do you get through to a 16, 17-year-old kid? You make it real simple. <laughs> and my favorite one, UCLA. Oh, Wooden, UCLA. He said, boys, that means unconditional love and affection. Mm. Whatever you do out there, I'm still going to love you. Unconditional love and affection. Putting those words together and making it mean something. Keep it simple, stupid. That's what I try to do in our organization as well, because it works for me. And they're catchy and you can remember them when it matters. When you go into the spotlight and when you're under stress, hopefully you remember those little snippets because those little snippets can lead you in the right direction of where you need to go. I love that. I mean, some of the things that I can remember and most of those I've had a chance to interview can remember are often just those little things. Right? Yeah. They made it simple for us as 17, 18 year olds. And now we still hold on to it as 50 year olds. So that trust acronym that hangs on the outside of your office. Yep. Were those the five that the coach used or were they five that you developed for Tropical Smoothie? Those are five that I developed myself. When I came into the role of CEO in 2018, I really had to spend some time thinking about what was really important to me. What could I stand up and espouse that really was authentic to me? Because I didn't want to just come up with stuff or read a book and throw something out. It had to be something that was meaningful to me. And this is what I came up with. Now we've got additional core values. We've got mission, we've got vision, all that stuff. But this is really Charles Watson. Mm. What I mean when I talk about teams being transparent with one another is like not only just not putting on airs, but like, hey, I'm having a bad day. I got this going on at home. And guys, honestly, it's usually something that's a little bit deeper and a little bit darker. It's not sunshine and lollipops. I got a problem and I need some help. Really telling it like it is, mm -hmm. putting it out there, just being transparent with one another and not holding back. There's a way to have intense, direct conversations and not be a jerk. There's a way to do it. And people struggle with the ability to do that. Responsibility. I always say, this isn't two-hand touch football. Right. This is full-on capitalism. Right. We got to get the job done or someone else will get the job done for us, especially in the CEO role. You either get results or you're not the CEO anymore. It is what it is. You're either a starter or you're not. It's real life. And I think we forget that sometimes in organizations, in business. And as our culture has evolved, it still matters. Results still matter. Now, to do that, you got to be unique as well. Be yourself. Every team can have a culture, but you're still your own unique person. In this day and age, Don, like nobody's looking to be, I want everyone to wear a blue shirt and khaki pants. Right. Everyone wants to do their own thing. Look at any sports team. I've got the towel over here. My hair looks like this. I want to wear different shoes. Yeah, I want to wear different shoes. Everybody's got different shoes. You can see it. Everyone has their own unique swagger. And that could be for some, it's, I'm very quiet and I just sit here and I get my job done. And for others, they're a little more animated, et cetera. It's allowing people to be. When we talk about promoting people or moving people throughout the organization, seeing that diverse sets of people, and I don't mean the standard diversity, diverse in how they think, how they dress, how they act, et cetera. It's that diversity of thought and all the other diversity that comes along with it. Seeing different, unique people move up in the organization, I think is very empowering to people. It allows people to go, man, I really can come here and be myself. With this work from home phenomenon where everyone's working in their bunny slippers and can do whatever they want, then they have to come back to the office and like, I'm supposed to wear a collared shirt. It doesn't work anymore. I mean, there's some bounds of corporate decorum, of course, but you got to let people much more so let their freak flag fly. No one's in three-piece suits anymore, Don. Right. Doesn't work that way. Be your unique self, but you can be your unique self and still be part of a team. Right. And then I know the S is service-oriented. Obviously, in your business, that's got to be enormously important. How do you encourage that? I mean, how do you make sure that they understand what's expected? a lot of conversation around what is our underlying business? What are our franchisees doing? They're serving day in and day out. So we need to model that behavior at our corporate support center with our field team. Our job is to serve franchisees so that franchisees can then serve the end guest. We can never fall down. We're the first link in the chain. Mm -hmm. So we can't think we're some corporate thing no, we're in the service business too. We might be working on marketing, but we're still doing it in order to serve franchisees to drive their business. Uh, and then finally, tenacious. I have a cup on my desk. Get stuff 
done. It's the same motto. If we have a brick wall in front of us, we need to tenaciously go under it, through it, over it, create a rope to throw it over, whatever we have to do to get it done. That doesn't mean being tenacious and willy-nilly and we're just running all over the place, et cetera. But once we lock and load and we know what it is that we're trying to do, right. we don't really want to stop and we don't want to slow down until that mission is accomplished. And again, remember, this is corporate stuff. This is roll out the new POS system or add the new quesadilla. Every business is a little bit different, but why do we want to be tenacious? Because when you're done being tenacious, you get results mm -hmm. and you can celebrate that because the fun part is celebrating. The fun part is the end zone and the high fives and the good jobs and the awards. Right. But those don't just happen. You got to have that tenacious attitude to go get it. Because by the way, all those awards aren't even fun if you haven't put a bunch of hard work into them. That is so true. I want to ask you a question we've asked every guest for almost four years now. I hear the word teams used often when I'm talking to organizations about what's happening. This is my team, me and my team, we're going to go do this. Actually, I think the word team is quite frankly overused in most contexts, especially corporately, because generally most of the people in those teams are actually just individuals working together to earn the same paycheck. But you've been part of teams. You've helped lead them now. If you were coaching me, taking a group of individuals and growing them into something, a team, what would be the elements? What would be some of the things that you would say, Don, pay attention to this if you're trying to build a team from a group of folks that you've just been handed to lead? I am big on, we're not going to go out and run wind sprints together and bond over that and throw up in the trash can or anything crazy like that. We're not going to do that, right? And listen, at this level, guess who your number one team is? Your number one team is your family. Mm -hmm. Understand that. And <laughs> this work team, at best, I'm going to be number two or number three, because maybe it's family and it's church and it's whatever else and it's work. Right. But the first thing that I always try to do is really get to know one another on a deep level, to share who you are, where you come from, and to really be transparent with one another. Because there is something innately special about sharing something great or hard, whatever it may be, that engenders wanting to spend more time with somebody, get to know somebody. You feel like you know somebody better when they share something with you. Mm -hmm. That in itself is a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice to give of yourself and tell a story, tell something about yourself. That leads, in my opinion, to being able to sacrifice and create more trust amongst one another as team members. We are all individuals. I get it. So it ultimately is about sacrifice. It is about doing something on your team and your work to pick them up, to help them. It doesn't feel good. It takes away from time you could be doing with somebody else. And it isn't fun. It hurts. That to me is how you actually create a team and work. Pick one another up. I'm down. My kid's sick. I've got a presentation due. Can you help me? Yes, I can help you. And then returning the favor. So how are we picking each other up as a team? You know, I love the idea of sharing something great with each other. The wins and losses, you hardly remember them, but it's the things you did together as a team that you miss the most. Right. It's those strange locker room stories or those strange moments on the bus ride or whatever it might have been that you go back to 20 years later. If you can create those experiences, those are moments that they'll never forget where you bond in a way that is unique and different. Right, right. You know, we've covered your parents and the fact that you grew up in the restaurant business. Yep. So hospitality has kind of always been in your blood. You encourage other restaurant executives regularly to put their heart into what they do. You're an executive. How do you put your heart into what you do? What does that look like for you? I think it's trying to understand and stay close to the end results of the business, which is handing a smoothie across the counter, handing our wrap or a flatbread or a catering order or whatever it may be to a guest. What we're trying to do is put a smile on somebody's face. The way that we do that is through our products and service. And in this business, the service aspect is just as important as the product. Also, to show our franchisees that I'm tenacious as well then I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Every franchisee in our system has my cell phone. They have my email address. I try to get out and go see them as much as I possibly can. When they have a need for me, I try to be there for them. That's serving. It's authentic. And it really is 
about driving this brand forward and driving their business forward. So I try to be really open for whatever our franchisees need me to do. Awesome. You know, we met through a couple of different relationships, but one of them was with Matt Holler from the International Franchise Association. I've actually interviewed a couple of other franchise folks on this podcast recently. Fascinated by the industry, that ability to go create guardrails around entrepreneurship that allow people that might otherwise flail to be a little more successful. Give me your pitch. Talk to me about why franchising as a concept is so important to the small business fabric of America. Franchising is simply the most powerful, the most long lasting, the most successful wealth creation tool ever created. And it's an American creation. One of my heroes, Benjamin Franklin, the first one to franchise, franchised his printing press down in Charleston. This allows the average American who can scrape together X amount of money, depending on what kind of franchise it is, to build a bicycle. I always call it a bicycle. I've built a bicycle. I rode it. I crashed it like 20 times. I changed stuff. I made it better. I put the streamers on. I put the streamers off. I put the cards in the wheels. I took the cards in the wheels off. And man, this thing is finely tuned now. This is a bike that you would be proud to drive around your neighborhood. It goes fast. It's sexy. It looks good. That's what Tropical Smoothie Cafe is. I've already made all the mistakes. I have a business that works. Come ride it. Come execute. Be in business for yourself, own the asset, ride the bike, execute on a business plan that's already been tested and works. And the greatest franchisees follow the business plan. Right. Those that struggle typically go outside of it. Right. They're like, well, I'm sure that works in Mobile, but let me try it differently because I live across the river or whatever it is. I could see that. I think that's one of the things that's been really interesting is I've tried to learn the business. I did not know Benjamin Franklin was the first franchisor. Absolutely. So I've spent a 30-year career in journalism, talking to coaches, athletes, many of the greatest of all time. And I've always asked one question. If you can identify one habit that you believe has allowed you to separate yourself from others, something you built into your daily routine that you believe gives you an advantage. What would it be? Wow. That's such a great question. It's such a hard question. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be in your top 10 answers on this one. I don't think Don, but here's what I lean into. What people never want to talk about is in any position where you get the privilege of leading people, there's a lot of pressure mm -hmm. and there's a lot of stress and it's hard. You're not ever really supposed to show it. But it's there because you want so much for things to go so well. And they don't all the time. Mm -hmm. It's chopping wood, Don. It's putting one foot in front of the other. It's showing up every day, whether you're hurt, whether you're injured, showing up every day, getting up out of bed every day and say, I'm going to go do the best that I can do today, knowing full well you might be at 70%. Mm -hmm. But you're going to be there. You're going to show up. Consistency consistency and driving forward and driving forward your mission. So that's what it is for me. I have to have the mindset of I'm here. I'm always here. I'm always available. I'm consistent because consistency is the greatest thing you could ever offer anyone that you're always there from what do parents do for kids. They're there. They're consistent. And that's what I want to do in my work life for my franchisees and for the people at Tropical Smoothie Cafe is for them to know I'm always there. Consistency over time equals credibility. There you go. So, how can our guests best connect with you, stay in touch and uh, learn more about you and the organization? Email's probably best for me, the fastest response time, right? Old sales guy, fast response. C Watson at tropical smoothie.com. C Watson at tropical smoothie.com. And you don't use serve the masses at tropical smoothie.com. I leave that to my franchisees. Again, listen, I serve franchisees. They serve the masses. There you go. There you go. Awesome. Hey, Charles, thank you so much today for just a wonderfully engaging conversation. Thanks for being a corporate competitor with us today. Thanks, Don. Appreciate the opportunity. Wow. By the way, I'm a big fan of Tropical Smoothie. I'm there at least once a week. So I'm glad to know that I'm contributing to Charles Watson's retirement fund. What an incredible guest. His lesson about specialist versus generalist. 
when he ended up at Cornell, was asked to take on this role that he didn't really want, punter. The idea that he would only be involved in four to five plays a game. He wasn't out front. He wasn't the star that he had hoped to be. But what it taught him, and that's that many of the specialists in your business will have outsized importance at some stages in the outcomes of your business. He was laid into his time in college when he registers a 70-yard punt against a great opponent, Princeton. And in the end, he got slapped on the back and said, you helped win the game. Being a specialist made a difference. Wasn't necessarily every week and it wasn't on every play, but being a specialist made a difference. And he now tells people that work for him that there will be times that you'll find yourself on the stage at some stage, but you have to be ready. You don't know when that's going to be. You have to be ready. Secondly, I love the high school basketball coach and how he talked about making things simple. Refuse to lose, RTL, UCLA, unconditional love. Some of those things are played into what Charles does today as a leader. It's important to keep things simple and to maybe look for those ways that we can create messages that are memorable. How might that look for you? And then finally, several guests have mentioned some version of this, but I love Charles being very graphic and funny when I said, how do you stay in touch with people? He says, well, I do this dramatic thing. I stand up from my desk and I walk around. I ask questions and I listen to their answers. And as you start to do that, you are beginning to know your employees better. And in that process, you also know what you can put into their toolbox to help make each and every one of those employees a little more successful. Great lessons, really fun conversation. It will make my mango smoothie all the better. I hope you all enjoyed this week's conversation. I appreciate you. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a rating and review on Apple and Spotify. Feedback helps us spread the insights of our guests to a wider audience. It actually increases our ratings. Thank you so much for those who have done so in the past. And catch new episodes every Wednesday. Subscribe at corporatecompetitorpodcast.com to be the first to get a chance to listen. And as a thank you gift, I will send you a chapter from one of my best-selling books. Stay connected with me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. My handle is at Don Yeager, D-O-N-Y-A-E-G-E-R. And until next week, I appreciate you.